Please take your seats, and if you could find a Bible where you are, and turn to page 1189. I'm going to read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, before Pedro comes to preach for us. Page 1189, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Two Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so says God's word. We need to start saying thank you, express our joy and gratitude of being able to be here as a family in this church that has loved and encouraged us a lot during these last, this, uh, last months and years. So thank you so much for your love and for the support uh, you have sent just last uh, week arrive uh, another part of your uh, help for us there in Portugal to help us with the ministry. We feel very well taken care of by God through you, so we are so thankful. Despite some setbacks, especially uh, due to the return of some families to Brazil, we have a lot of foreign people living in Lisbon, and many of them are Brazilians, also Africans, but they can't stay for a too long time period because it's really expensive to live uh, in Lisbon. But some have returned to Brazil. But our church, church has, uh, has grown, and new people are approaching with the intention of becoming part of the membership. Some young people of our church have brought very... Uh, we are into. Uh, we are glad because they make. They are making very good decisions to uh, serve the Lord, uh, and and that brings joy to to us as a church. Some are presenting themselves as serious candidates to be for us what Silas and Timothy were for Paul, because this this letter uh, become uh, begins with this idea Paul and other two. We know that they were partners because we know uh, when they uh, were together, uh, Acts 7, uh, chapter 17, we, we read about them, Paul and Silas in Thessalo Thessalonica, right then? Uh, Paul and Silas in Berea, and then Silas and 
Timothy in Berea, in the same chapter, and Paul goes to Athens and asks that uh, Silas and Timothy to, to, reach out, to come to him, to meet him in Athens and as soon as possible. Everything we, 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 this we, we, we can read in Acts chapter 17 in the beginning, the, the verse 15 says that Paul, Paul asked Silas and Timothy to, to go to meet him. He always wanted to have partners, co-workers, and it's good to have partners. It's good to have co-workers. We know that. That's why we are so thankful, because we look at you as partners, as co-workers there in Portugal. So it's good to have uh, that kind of fellowship and, and help that you are giving us. We are looking forward to a pastor from Brazil coming soon to work with us. He has faced uh, some great challenges in order to gather all the necessary conditions to be able to move to Portugal. But we have prayed and we wait on the Lord because the work is His. It's His work. He knows uh, what we need in Portugal. He knows what is best. But we know that it's good to have partners, co-workers. We need more pastors, we need more leaders, more preachers. And we are asking that uh, to the Lord. So this initial part, we see now how important it is for Paul and we know his life and to have partners. But from the verse three until the verse 12, we can see that as one of the portions of scripture that conveys, presents our faith and our hope very well. We, we, we read about the growing faith, more believers, the increasing love, more service. When there are love, there are service, there are sacrificial service. People want to work, wants to serve, to be useful. In verse 5, we read about the kingdom of God. In verse 7, the revelation of the Lord Jesus with his mighty angels. Verse 9, the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. A glory that is perceived and admired in his saints, the believers, like we read in verse 10. This is our faith. That's our hope. We want to see this. We are seeing this. This is a Christian faith in action. So this passage shows the reason why we are together in this place and why we want more places like this to spread through our countries here in England, now in Portugal, that new biblical churches be established, that our work, our mission, we want to be used by God to, to see new churches being established in our country. But I would like to highlight a word in verse 4. Uh, like Pastor John read in your version, NIV is the perseverance. Um, but in my, I'm using ESV, English Standard Version, in verse 4, um, the word is steadfastness. In that young lady's prayer, she, she used that word, steadfast. Steadfastness is a very important word for us as a Christian uh, community. Patience. There's a, another way of translate this word. Stability, cheerful or hopeful endurance, constancy, patience, continuance, waiting. This is so important for for us as a believers, as believers. The characteristic of a man who is not swerved by or from his deliberate purposes and his loyalty to faith and godliness by even the greatest trials and sufferings. He stays faithful. He stays confident. Genuine faith is the same as constancy, perseverance, steadfastness, endurance. The Lord Jesus said, and that is written in Luke chapter 21 verse 19, for by your endurance, you will gain your lives. This is a very important word that Paul uses here. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36, For you have need of endurance, 
so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And in the end of this, in the last chapter of this letter, Paul uses again um, this word, uh, verse 5, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. This is why this is one of the portions of Scripture that best conveys, presents our faith. And we could summarize this first chapter like this, an expression of gratitude for the lives of those who, even in the midst of suffering caused by the lost, those who don't know God, but they show constancy, they show endurance in faith and growth in love while waiting for relief and glorification. We know that uh, the circumstances of the beginning of the church in Thessalonica was confusion, conflict, contrition. We can read that in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 uh, through, uh, until 9. The beginning of uh, that church was an easy, light, smooth. For us also, back in Portugal, the beginning of the church has also uh, not been easy. And we know that here uh, in England, it's also not easy to plant new churches. And to be a church, there's a lot of challenges. That's why we need to consider the past. We need to look to the future, but not forget the present, what we need to do right now. So this is the, the, the way that Paul approached in, in this begin, in the, the beginning of this letter. Verses 3 and 4, he considered the past. He, he's giving thanks for the signs that he saw, he heard. Uh, of spiritual spiritual vitality of those believers. The way that in the past, in the recent past, they, uh, they show their faith. And they, they show their, they were serving and, and loving. So it's important to consider the past. Verse, verses 5 to 10, we, can, we should look to, forward to the vision of the glory of Christ, look to the future. But... Consider the present, work now today, so that Christ may be glorified. That's the prayer uh, written in verses 11 and 12. So considering the past, give thanks for the signs of spiritual vit uh, vitality. Verse 3, your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. This is spiritual vitality, vitality, faith growing, steadfastness, uh, verse 4, uh, in all persecutions and in the afflictions, they are, they were, in, they are, they are facing suffering, verse 5 mentions here, suffering, when a church is grounded in its faith, it will be fruitful in its work, even in difficult circumstances. When a church is grounded in its faith, it will be fruitful in its work. Although Thessalonians, believers, were not without challenges, their love for each other was growing, and their endurance and faith were remarkable. But where good things are happening, through Christ and for Him, the opposition, both internal and external, will certainly arise. With the Thessalonians, it was not no different. Many of the questions addressed by Paul in his first letter, in the first letter, persisted. The same problems. In many ways, his struggles only increased in a short space of time since Paul wrote his first letter. Persecution continued to challenge the faith, like we read in this first chapter. The false teachers continue to arouse confusion about the day of the Lord, chapter 2. And the lazy Christians remain a burden for the church there, chapter 3 of this letter. Despite these significant challenges, Paul begins this letter by stating, We ourselves boast about you in the churches of God. Although there were a number of issues that need, uh, needed Clarification, Paul could 
be very comforted by the news that the church was alive, alive and well. In the first verses, he identifies four reasons why he was so grateful for the church in the Thessalonica. It's a hard word to, to spell, to say. But this is the four characteristics. A faith that was real. A love that was growing. A hope that was encouraging. A future that was safe. So we need to look back. We need to receive news that other believers were faithful, loving, hopeful, and confident. That encourages us in Portugal. When we heard about you, what the Lord is doing with you, has done in the past, how he prepared our people to be together, to serve him, to pray for other countries, other nations, and to send support and to do visits. We need the best. We need to look back and be encouraged by that. But also we need to look to the future. Look forward for, to the vision of the glory of Christ. Verses 5 to 10. That you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Verse 7. We read about relief. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, there will be relief. Verse 9, the presence of the Lord and the glory of His might. We want to see that. We want to see the Lord. We, we want to be in His presence. That's our hope. We need to look forward to that. We know where, where our walk will end. Verse 10, when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. The Lord Jesus will come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all who believe. Verse 10. This is the main reason why we value both having and being a local church. And why we want to, to have new biblical churches. That new biblical churches to be established in our country. We pray for that. We want to work for that. But there is a sentence that uh, <coughs> struck, struck me. I, 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 I believe that will struck you as you meditate in verse 5, the beginning of this verse. Evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Believers could be wondering, if we have faith, if our love is growing, if we know God and if we obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, why are we suffering? Why the Lord allows that kind of suffering to us? We, we can also ask, why contempt? Why to be despised by the world, the people around us, we feel that strongly, very strong in our culture. I'm sure that you feel the same here as Christians. Why the accusation that we are those who use the hate speech, we are the troublers? Because we are Christians, we think that we deserve a peaceful and quiet life with health, good health, with abundant support, with recognition of others. But Paul says that the persecutions and afflictions that the believers of Thessalonica were enduring were an evidence of the righteous judgment of God. What is that? Weren't the believers who should be suffering? Why the believers? Why those who are showing that they, are, they have faith, they, they are growing in love, why are they or are we suffering? What we can conclude is that the Thessalonians demonstrated their, that their salvation, determined only by faith in the Lord Jesus, was genuine because they, like Christ, were willing to suffer because of God and 
his kingdom. They were worthy of the kingdom of God because they, they were willing to suffer because of, because of Christ, because, because of his kingdom. And to understand his understanding his biblical truth helps us to persevere and endure, to be constant in the faith. Jesus said, John 15, verse 19, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Verses 6 until 12, When Jesus is revealed from heaven, He will bring relief to those who love Him and that's our hope. Look forward to the future, this relief. But we also know that He will bring retribution to those who reject Him. Looking forward also implies considering the future of those who don't know God, who don't want to be in places like this. They don't belong to a local church. They don't, they don't want to to hear the word to be preached, taught. They don't know God. Those who don't obey the gospel of the Lord, of our Lord Jesus. Verse, verses 8 and 9, flame, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. The wicked who persecute the godly don't always receive the righteous judgment in this life. In fact, uh, this apparent uh, prosperity of the wicked and the hardships of the godly have been a problem for many of God's people. See Psalm 73, Asaph. Also Habakkuk chapter 1. But there's a, a, a sentence of Jeremiah in chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 1. He says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you. Yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper. Why do all who are treasures thrive? Why live a godly life if the main experience is suffering? If we need to deny ourselves and we need to be available to suffer for Christ and to serve others sacrificially. The Thessalonians demonstrated that their salvation Determined by faith, only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, was genuine because they, like Christ, were willing to suffer because of God and His kingdom. As Christians, we must live for eternity and not just for history, for our time here in the earth, in earth on, on earth. In fact, living in view of the value of eternity is what gives meaning to our Christian life today. We walk by faith, not by sight, not what we see. So we must live for eternity. Because what kind of future face unbelievers? Those who don't, don't walk by faith. Verse 6, affliction. Verse 8, flaming fire. <coughs> Verse 9, vengeance, with punishment, and eternal destruction. He says, this is real. Jesus thought this. The world that rejects Christ will receive from God exactly what He has given to His Son and to His people. When God rewards, He pays in kind. I read... Uh, story about a Christian doctor that had tried to testify of his faith to a very moralistic woman 
who belong to a church that deny the need of for salvation and the reality of future judgment, hell, or lake of fire. She used to say, God loves me too much, so he won't condemn me. I can't believe that God created a place like a lake of fire, she said. However, the, that woman got sick, and the diagnosis were cancer, and surgery was required. I wonder if I should real, really operate on you, the doctor told her in the hospital room. I love you too much to cut your body and make you suffer. Doctor, said the woman, if you really love me, you will do everything possible to save me. How can you allow this horrible thing to remain in my body? So it was easy for him to explain that what cancer is for the body, sin is for the world, and both must be treated radically and completely. Just as a doctor cannot love health without hating the disease and treating it, so God cannot love justice without hating sin and judging it. So we need to look forward to the vision of the glory of Christ, both in the condemnation of unbelievers and in the salvation of those who believe, the believers. But we need to look to the present and work now, work today so that Christ may be glorified. Verses 11 and 12. That our God may make you worthy of His calling and may fulfill every resolve for you and every work of faith. That the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him. Work of faith. God in His love and grace gives his own, own people the privilege of participating with him in what he's doing. They are deceived, however, if they believe that they, are, they can contribute anything to what he's doing. What a sobering statement, sad uh, comment, uh, commentary on this passage. That you would view your work as contributing to God's work is to suggest that God somehow needs you to ensure his success. The sobering truth is that God really does not need you, he does not need me, he does not need us to accomplish his work. He can get along perfectly fine without us. God, however, is not content to do it alone. He graciously extends to you an invitation to be part with Him, to participate with Him in what He's doing in the world. You get the amazing privilege of joining with Him in a venture that is guaranteed to succeed. That assurance is what makes you your participation in the work of His Church so fulfilling. Despite the many challenges and setbacks, you can be confident that His work will succeed. In other words, because you know that you are on the winning team, you are not afraid to give your all on the field. Our job is to help the word of the Lord spread ahead. Reading the Bible, Praying the Bible, talking about these promises, this truth, and pray for one another. As Paul prayed for the Thess Thessalonians, so that the Lord may direct our hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Some considerations, some final applic and applications to, to us. An important consideration, an easy life. We all want easy, smooth lives, success, comfortable lives, but an easy life can lead to a superficial faith. 
we feel inspired or encouraged when we see someone handle a difficult time gracefully and faithfully just as Paul felt encouraged watching that church those believers is when we face difficult things trials faithfully with growing love that we can encourage others it's not having fun <coughs> entertainment but being faithful in difficult moments times when our faith is tested our worth is being revealed revealed how can we demonstrate God's power in our, in our lives? Trials do not make a person, but they reveal what they are made of. We are worth what we believe. That's our value, our worth, what we believe. We are worth what we believe. We can read that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. God certainly know, knows our hearts and even before we are tested. But we do not know our own, own hearts and others don't know what our value is. That is why we are learning to ask God to make us worthy of His calling so that we really have some value. That we be identified with Him, with His name. That's what gives value worth to us so this is the present to work work now work today so that Christ may be glorified in us through us so this passage shows the reasons why we are together in this place and why we want to more to have more places and the word of our God to spread across our countries. New biblical churches to be established. This portion of the scripture is an expression of gratitude for the lives of those who even in the midst of suffering caused by the lost, those who don't know God, show endurance, perseverance in faith and growth in love while waiting for relief and glorification and Paul ends this letter with these words may the Lord give you and we can pray for us may the Lord give us peace at all times in every way may the Lord be with us all we need him and we have this privilege work with him to him so may the Lord give us peace, endurance, perseverance at all times in every way that's my prayer for us all thank you mm -hmm.